What do you guys think about? Well, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen, and uh, thank you, uh, Dennis Sperling, for hosting this uh, very important conversation. Um, let me just say that um, we have to give black women, uh, particularly professional, educated black women, those who have aligned themselves with feminism and even now womanism, we have to give them a lot of credit for being uh, very savvy. Um, we have to give them a lot of credit for being um, adept ideologically in a way that um, black men are just now catching up to, okay? And so uh, when we talk about this, this, this pol polarity, so on the one hand, uh, black women are exceptional, right? At the one hand, they stand out as these figures who represent, you know, American success. So we have your, your Oprah Winfrey. Uh, we have your people in entertainment like her, or Shonda Rhimes. Um, you have your lawyers. You have your professors. You have your women in business. We continue to hear all the time how well Black women are doing in terms of education, in terms of um, all sorts of um, metrics which say something about a high quality of life. Um, but in juxtaposition to that, um, you have the other narrative of Black women being victims, Black women being uh, subject to Black American patriarchy, Black men are holding them back, they can't go forward, they're in poverty, they're single mothers, um, they um, are discriminated you know, against at a variety of levels. Um, I mean, this is the this is the double helix, man, that we have been dealing with for for uh, fifty plus plus years. But I have to I have to to put it in the hands of the intellectuals, um, the black feminists. Um, you know, people like you know Michelle Wallace, people like Beverly Guy Sheftall, people like in particular Kimberly Kimberly Crenshaw. If there, if there is anyone who has been very very important in doing this, this is the the professor who was at USC, uh, excuse me, um, UCLA. Um, um, she has been very pivotal in in shaping, um, you know, this type of paradoxical way of looking at black women. And the thing about it is that white society has 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 embraced it, is it accepted it, it, it co-signs it, it puts millions, billions, now even hell, maybe even trillions of dollars behind this. And um, and and yeah, that's. That's what we're dealing with. It is a it's 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 a very interesting paradox, binary, um, filled with contradictions, and it works in the way to keep black men off. It is used in a very weaponized fashion um, to um, it's to silence us and to demobilize us. So um, that's just my you know preliminary remarks um, about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ronald Neal. And so I'm come, I'm approaching this from a litigator. I want I'm what is the end game here? How did what does this do for them, uh, G with the PhD? They it seems to me they're able to get resources from the dominant society based on their victimhood status, based on the fact that they're the lowly uh, oppressed group, the lowliest and oppressed group here in America. And then they're able to maintain a, a hierarchy, uh, be at the apex of the hierarchy in the black community by holding themselves out as the queen mother goddess who can do no wrong and who's above reproach. G with the PhD, how does that work? And what are your thoughts on that, Doc? Uh oh, I think we got some 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 uh, sound issues there. G with the PhD, are you there? If you can hear me, we'll we'll have to go come back to him. I guess what we'll do is we'll go to the kosher clinician, and then we'll go to the venerable Dr. Tia San Johnson at the end to uh, bat anchor. Kosher clinician, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think this whole crux and more or less is what I call a thinking era. You know, I did a show on my channel with the kosher clinician called "Empower to Be Depowered." And so many have been empowered, but on the flip side, they're being depowered because they don't see the error of their way. Mm -hmm. um, the goddess complex, um, Brother, Brother Sperling, I think more or less pontificates um, 
you know, if you look at through the lens of the esoteric, and if you go back to the lens of the gospel, um, it's an age old adage where the woman has always been at war with having authority over the man. And it's nothing new. It's been going on for years. You know, um, the scripture said that the, that the man, um, the woman will have a desire for her husband, but he will rule over her. And so what you're seeing now is an age old adage in the esoteric where women still want that power. They want to have the power to subjugate their man. And the Oliver T. Hassan Johnson came up with a brilliant term called the cocky serve. I came up with a term because, you know, I, I don't want to keep you know, taking, taking, taking his credits on and start paying him royalties, <laughs> uh, called the commodification of subjugation. And basically that term that I've created called the commodification of subjugation basically means that the man is actually a commodity that's being used by the woman, which in essence is tied to solipsism. And basically what that does, it makes the man seem like he's less than instead of putting that man a, a, as the pillar in his home, in his community. And we're seeing the ravages and the after effects of it. And that's one of the reasons why me as a clinical therapist, I started the channel, um, the coach of clinician, Alice Supplementation, to address the issues that a lot of black men are having. Because as a clinical therapist, we don't talk about these things, Dennis, um, in the context um, of, of a traditional um, therapy. Most traditional therapists seen through the feminist lens, the white feminist lens. And so it does not address the nuances that are specified for understanding the psyche of black men. So I started the kosher clinician. I started my YouTube channel as a way to have what's called a group catharsis. Because what we, what you are seeing now is a group catharsis where men are coming together through a spirit of universality. We're coming together through a spirit of universality to address a lot of these selling issues that a lot of black men are dealing with, but it's never been addressed in the lens of traditional, um, what you call traditional, um, the tra the traditional therapeutic model. So what I'm doing, I'm more of an outlier because what I'm doing is somewhat dangerous because it does not adhere to the PC norm. But I've, I've, I've more or less determined it's a mandate because I've always had a burgeoning love and a burgeoning desire to see black men empower and black men liberate. And shout out to brother Ron Neal with his terminology, uh, um, live out loud black male independence. So, you know, this has been an ongoing collaboration where, you know, where men are coming together, you know, sharing through what I call the group catharsis where men are sharing in the spirit of universality and brotherhood and where we're working to understand the ravages of culture okay. feminism. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Coach of Clinician. Dr. T.S.I. Johnson, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I think this is all about money and power because I, I assume that Black women now haven't been vested with the money that comes from basically playing the double victim role, something that you may want to explain. Uh, i.e. racist, sexism, oh, woe is me, we're the victims. And then on, on the flip side, they're able to maintain social status in the black community, irrespective of the fact that we generally are the low folks on the totem pole. They're still, the, they're still, they're still higher than the rest of us over here. You see, so it's almost like they get the money and they get the, they get the money associated with the, 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 what is it, the most educated group in America, the, the most virgin group of millionaires, uh, or, uh, entrepreneurs, you know the story, you read the rhetoric, politicians, vice president now, uh, a, 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 a woman, a black woman. Do you understand what I'm, I, I think the end goal is, is money and power. I, I, I don't think it's some lofty ideal of, of, of oh, we, you know, God is in power us and, and whatnot. I think that's what it is because I, I just have to look at people and, and, and base this on human nature. People once vested with power and once given money don't want to give it up. And that is not something uh, that, you know, and I think black American women are subject to that. What are your thoughts on this very complicated subject? You can pick it up where you want to, where you want to, Doc. Well, first, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Um, yes, second, uh, you know, I wish everybody well. It's good to see you brothers here. No doubt. Uh, I'm parked in an area where I got security driving around me. So I'm trying to make sure uh -oh. they don't mess with me. Anyway. But no, nah, look, I think the way uh, my brother Green Gorilla put it the other day uh, when his last video, when he talked about Kamala getting into office, he said something that few people have the courage to say. And basically what he said was, this was a token position. Mm -hmm. and, and many of our sisters are willing to take token positions because you're right, they are opting for power. What we have seen happening, especially in the last six years, most particularly with the rise of BLM, has been a coup for all intents and purposes. Many of these black women have been trying to create and push a coup for power. 
But this is all predicated on resources. It's predicated on options that they've been they've been handed. And when you talk about being the most educated, they're not they're not the most educated. They're the most enrolled in mm-hmm. higher education. But they've tried to parlay that into some kind of opt for power. See, the irony to this is, you know, especially due to white media, they've been able to control the narrative that black men are trifling and incapable and they are super heroic. But they're super heroic, you know, to whatever extent we define that, mainly based on resources that they've been extended that black men largely haven't been. So they still and they still are in many ways. This is one of the reasons they were pushing for Biden to get in an office with such intensity. It wasn't just to have Kamala as a VP. It was also because they knew that people like Trump threatened the security that they felt for decades now with certain types of resources. But the point is that divinity that you speak of, that goddess syndrome, is really a product of being able to seemingly, right, seemingly succeed in the midst of all of the poverty and the, and the, and the, and the dysfunction in the black community. But it's easy to do that when you have a floor that's provided for you that's not provided for your men. So they're going to school, they're, they're able to get white collar jobs, they're transitioning into politics. There are more of them that have been, have been going into electoral politics than black men. Uh, and so we're seeing those numbers continue to rise for the last couple decades. A lot of this is predicated on this access. But here's the thing, when you're given this kind of access long enough, you stop seeing it as something you're given and you see it as something that you are owed. And you start to look at it as something that makes you better than those around you who don't get it. But the ultimate irony is that black men are doing both better and worse than they are without any help. Mm -hmm. As far as those of us that are employed from 18 to 65 years old, we make more than they do. There are more brothers with six figures than there are black women, but there are also more brothers that are homeless. There are also Mm -hmm. way more brothers that are unemployed. But my point is black men are doing better and worse with no support. But the narrative is that they're super heroic because of the support from the state and they're able to push this agenda that has been passed from grandmother to mother to daughter that black men are beneath them and lucky to be in their very presence. Mm. How did that even happen? I mean, Doc, okay, here's what I don't understand, man. How did, and that, that's what I refer to as the goddess, the goddess part of the victim goddess. How can we, <laughs> how did that happen and how do we not see it? Here's what I wrote in my notes. Black men hold black women in high regard in the black community. Black men often refer to black women as queens or goddesses, not because of their virtues or their or, or of a particular woman or accomplishment, something she's done. Instead, these titles are bestowed upon these lovely ladies solely because of the color of their skin and their anatomy. This mindset it reinfo- it, it is reinforced in the black community where the mother is considered the sacred, sacred cow above reproach and can do no wrong. How did that happen? Let's let's just break it up. How did that part happen? Well, I think I think each of the brothers on the panel uh, probably see a different uh, angle to it, you know. But the way I usually approach it is this: a lot of this got kicked into high gear in the 1980s, right? In the 1980s, you started to see women who were raised with this idea, as we've heard many times before, that they can have it all. But they were coming into a time period where they had, uh, you know, unprecedented access to higher education. Many of these women were starting into positions where they were making six figures at a very young age. And I remember going to school with them. I remember graduating with women who had degrees in English, bachelor degrees, but they were now serving as hundred thousand dollar consultants for tech companies. And it didn't make any sense, but it was nevertheless how a lot of these women got in. What a lot of us didn't know, including the women themselves, is that they were, yet again, as Gigi pointed out the other day, tokens. They were tokens that benefited many corporations in that they provided them, you know, a double minority. They were women and they were black. But, and this was the interesting thing too, a lot of the women I knew who were working these kind of positions, they weren't employees of these corporations. They were contractors. And so when you had something like the 2007, 2008, you know, great uh, recession, a lot of those people started to lose those those paper pushing kind of gigs that paid a lot because they were essentially being paid to be tokens, but it you know it nonetheless impacted them. So they had the positions, they had the titles, they had the income, and when you're coming from a relatively poor community, 
the idea is that if I'm able to do all of this with very little struggle, and all we hear about is racism and difficulty, especially in the lives of black men, then I am better. I'm able to do what my man can't do. And if, in fact, I have to almost mother him, school him, to, because he's not able to do it, and I am. So there must be something inherently better about me. And I cannot tell you professionally and privately how many women that I've met who've been socialized into this idea that they are fundamentally better beings because they, they are able to navigate the world as black women would do so in a way that many black men can't. And instead of looking at it in terms of why and questioning the resources they got and how that contributes to their self-image, which is mainly a solipsistic narcissism, what, they, what they've come to is a superiority complex. Right. And that's one of the mm -hmm. dynamics that we have between black men and women. And black men now are raising questions we have never stated right. out loud to this degree right. before. Right. And they do not know where these questions are coming from or how to respond. <laughs> All right, so the G with the PhD is is got his is is sound back. G with the PhD, man, Green Gorilla, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, so Dr. Tia San Johnson and Dr. Ronald O'Neill and the culture clinician, they they talked about the goddess status. Can you explain to us and just pick it up from wherever you are, but how do oh. they how do they maintain this victim status this we're the supreme victims of everything and then say i'm strong independent and don't need a man and then when we look at history like for instance the history of slavery for the most part black women weren't here for the first uh, up until maybe the last 50 years of slavery in equal numbers I mean, but they will always go back to that. How how does that happen? I mean, if you if you want to go into that and whatever you have uh, already uh, you know thought up or contemplated on this 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 subject, go ahead and let us have it. But oh. if you can touch that, I certainly would appreciate it, Doc. Oh wow, man, that's a that's a lot. But thank you for uh, <laughs> asking me for uh, asking me to be here. And yes, uh, I don't know how to follow up from Dr. Ron O'Neill, the kosher clinician, or Dr. Tia Son Johnson, but I'll do my best. Um, I, I think, you know, I have to go back to what Ronald, uh, Dr. Neal was saying earlier. Uh, much of the success that Black women enjoy and the psychological disposition that they have, it comes from their... Uh, alignment with feminist ideology. And uh, so, uh, you know, feminists, white feminists basically were able to juxtapose themselves into a position to where they considered themselves to be just as oppressed as black folks. Right. So sexism in and of itself has connotations directly related to racism, okay? Now, if you, if, if you just explore the history of feminism all the way back to the suffragettes, all the way up to second wave feminism, all the way up to third wave feminism, and so the early suffragettes were, you know, Elizabeth, Katie, Stanton, uh, Susan B. Anthony, and uh, what they wanted to do was basically you know, have the right to vote and the right to enter into occupations and jobs, just like the men. And they felt like they were oppressed in that regard. And so what they had begun to do was as a means by which to advance their goals. And they, they started to talk, you know, pretty derisively about black men, right? And so the idea was, how dare you give black men the right to vote? Now, these are men who fought in the Civil War, 
These are men who fought World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam War, so on and so forth. But these men actually fought for the rights that, you know, these white women were able to just juxtapose themselves in. So uh, they considered themselves to be a minority group, although they're not a minority. They even outnumber white men. Uh, but they were labeled a minority group. And black women, for the most part, are riding the wave of white feminism. So the benefits, they're riding on the coattails of white feminism. So as white women are able to enjoy the jobs that really actually in the affirmative action policies that were actually supposed to be allocated towards black men, uh, you know, what? black it, women by extension are able to now, you know, uh, enjoy a, a positionality and, and Dr. Johnson is right about this. Uh, so they're now able to say that we're a double minority. Not only are we black and suffer the effects of racism, but we're women, so we're a part of a, a unique minority group. And so therefore, we're, we're more oppressed than any other group. And if you tie lesbianism to that and you put classism on top of that, well, then they're quadruply oppressed. And, and and this is why, you know, I, I always refer back to the Combahee River Collective Statement, because this is a statement in which black lesbian feminists asserted that unless they were free, nobody else will be free because they will, uh, upon, you know, securing freedom, have eradicated all forms of oppression that exist. Now, I think this is delusional. It, it has no basis in historical reality. It's anachronistic. It only looks at a particular slice in time. But, I mean, if, if you look at the history of war and genocide, you'll see that the primary group that is allocated for the most severe forms of violence, oppression, exploitation, marginalization, or battle-aged men. And this is why the work mm. of Dr. Tommy Curry is so important, right? But the point is, they get to claim the victimhood status, but then they get to assert that they're goddesses by virtue of the fact, like Dr. Tiasan Johnson says, because they're able to do better and they have more access to power socially, politically, uh, th than black men do. And, 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 and this is primarily because of family law is, is due to uh, a, a whole, you cover this quite often on your show, child support law, um, all kind of domestic violence law. So these women and, and they're able to basically excise men out of the picture at their will. But this whole goddess uh, notion, I think, comes from Afrocentrism. Um, and it is true that in ancient Black cultures, Black women were revered as goddesses, but they always had male counterparts. It was, it was not like they were just Black female goddesses ruling and reigning over over men uh, you had male and female counterparts goddesses they had corresponding you know uh partners but you know this whole idea that you know just because in ancient classical civilizations that women weren't treated as bad as uh you know white people treated their women that all of a sudden they're goddesses that stand above and beyond reproach it's, it's just anachronistic it, it has no bearing in historical reality or fact at all and so, uh, you know, uh, look, I've studied Ben Yakinen, I've studied Theophile Obinga, Ivan Van Sertima, Chia Gante Diop, uh, the whole host of scholars. Uh, and, and, and at one point in time, I considered myself to be a staunch Afrocentrist. So although we can understand that women 
you know, do have a vital and a uh, important part to play in the black community. I mean, this idea that they are goddesses above and beyond their men mm-hmm. is is inane. It, it it just has no basis in historical fact or reality. I mean, if you look at any pantheon of gods of ancient uh, classical African civilization, then I mean, you'll you'll see that you have Alsar at the head, especially right. if you're talking about Kemet. And and that's not to say that you know women are less valuable, but I mean, we just got to be honest about this. And uh, I think a lot of people just don't have insight because they just don't, you know, have the the in-depth understanding because they haven't read much. Thank you, Doc. I want you guys to take a look at some, uh, I'm going to call it propaganda, (laughs) but it apparently is a video that's circulating on uh, TikTok. And this is more of that victim status propaganda. It's almost like you get a heavy dose of it each and every time. Note first, you got this beautiful young black woman. She's on TikTok, so of course she's going to get attention. She's... She's, uh, you know, she's not obese, she's not overweight, she's sweet voice, whatever. And so, but I want you guys to listen to this and listen to what she's saying and listen to how dangerous this could be. Just check it out. Key in on some words when she says who oppresses her, right? Not just the dominant society, but take a listen. Black women more likely to have their femininity contested and are still falsely perceived to be more masculine. Let's talk about it. To understand the history of this, we have to go way back because while myths are spread undermining the image of both black men and women, women were doubly discredited. As early as the 16th century, early European explorers who had made their way to Africa would comment on the anatomical features of the populations they encountered. The dramatized stories were seen as fact and informed some of the first European perceptions of African people. To these imperialist travelers, the dark skin, white lips, and nose of some indigenous populations resembled those of apes, so they started saying that Africans engaged in sex with them. This imperial rhetoric that animalized African populations was used to justify their enslavement. It classified them as other and paved the way for the dehumanization and sexual exploitation of both black men and women brought to the New World. In fact, colonial scientific investigation suggested that black people were subhuman and less evolved than white European. But this is just the beginning, having gone to force colonial gender division, so stay tuned for part two. The history of the masculinization of black women, part two. So as I was saying, over time, the imperial discourse took a more gender tone, with comparisons being made between African and European women in order to justify the exclusion of African women from the category of women altogether. Sarah Bartman is a perfect example of this. Brought to Europe from South Africa in 1810, Bartman was displayed in circuses and public squares until she passed away. Upon her death, scientists assessed her elongated labia and promoted their findings as proof that black women's deficiencies made them less womanly than their white counterparts. The social hierarchies of the imperial enterprise placed black women at the bottom of the social scale and so they suffered from a triple oppression, oppression from the white man, the white woman, and the black man. They were dehumanized not only as economic and reproductive property, but also as a disposable sexual commodity. I've got more coming up, so stay tuned for part three. The history of the masculinization of black women, part three. But as I was saying, at the time, black women were further dehumanized and defeminized in the sense that they were forced to provide white men with a sexual outlet that could allow them to protect the purity of their white wives. And so white women were seen as virtuous and pure, whereas black women were seen as lustful and vicious. Also to note, slave societies had a deep division of labor between enslaved and white women. Enslaved women were expected to show stamina and strength in the fields, whereas white women ideally did little to no outdoor work. Europeans believed that female agriculture proved African women's degradation and thus the superiority of the European culture. And to balance out, for example, black women who were thought to be subhuman by their white masters were not protected from violence. They were seen as beasts in the field who did not need their bodies and virtues protected. I've got more coming up, so stay tuned for part four. The history of the masculinization of black women. Hang in there, guys. It's almost over. Women part four. So as I was saying, black women were seen as beasts on the field, which by the way, they had to be strong in order to carry out all that forced labor, while white women were seen as true women based on their role in the home and their traits of innocence and weakness. Enslaved black women never got the chance to display the traits attributed to white women because they were always in the public sphere of work and never allowed in the private sphere of the home. Also, when punished, they were often forced to be naked, which contributed to their dehumanization and stripped away any femininity while white women were just head to toe, which ensured their nobility and womanhood. And so black women were not treated like true women, but instead they were treated as if they were black men. Willing the stereotypes that started to emerge surrounding black women that they were sexually promiscuous and aggressive were used to justify the atrocities committed against them. Part five will be the last one in this series, so stay tuned for that. The history of the masculinization of black women, part five. Let's hope that TikTok doesn't censor this one. So today, the masculinization, defeminization, and hypersexualization of black women and girls contributes to social approval of violence against them, particularly against dark skinned black women and black trans women. For one, black female features are fetishized for their size and shape. Black trans women is now in this category. Let's keep listening. And while some may perceive it as an empowering way of glorifying black female bodies, it doesn't necessarily check in a culture that allows black women to define their own sexual agency, and it contributes to the sexual exploitation, assault, and debasement of black women. Secondly, when a woman or girl is perceived as masculine, she's more likely to be seen as strong, aggressive, and less feminine. Look at how the media perceives the incomparable Serena Williams or how it treats Megan Thee Stallion. What this does though, is feed to the fact that black women are capable of handling themselves and thus less in need of protection. To conclude the series, the belief that black women are more masculine and less goes all the way back to the 16th century and is based on the notion that people of African descent are animalistic and aggressive. And sadly, that thought still persists today. All right, before before we, you know, first thing is when you look at female slavery in the United States. It indicates that from 1700 to 1400, an estimated 43,000 slaves were imported into Virginia. It, it, but but when you go down here to the actual numbers, and, and we can we can we can talk about this because I know Dr. Tia Son Johnson has quoted um, one of our great uh, leaders, uh, one of our great scholars, as related to you know the actual numbers. And I believe we weren't actually uh, brought in equal numbers to around about. 1808 once they began to outlaw slavery but for the most part what this will show you is that um men were imported uh recent scholarship 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 suggests that the number of women and men imported in this period was more or less equal included high numbers of children but before that it was vast majority men 
So when, when black women come along and say, we were victims just like you, it's almost like they were right there with us, you know, in, in, in 16, you know, 16, oh, uh, when we were, when we were first brought over and that's just not, that's just not correct. You know, that's in 1619, that's just not correct. Dr. Ronald Neal, you hadn't spoken in a while. What are your, before we, you know, first thing is when you look at female slavery in the United States, it indicates that from 1700 to 1400, estimated 43,000 slaves were imported into Virginia. It, it, but, but when you go down here to the actual numbers and, and we can, we can, we can talk about this because I know Dr. Tia Son Johnson has quoted uh, one of our great uh, leaders, uh, one of our great scholars, as related to you know the actual numbers, and I believe we weren't actually uh, brought in equal numbers till around about 1808, once they began to outlaw slavery. But for the most part, what this will show you is that. Um, Men were imported. Uh, recent scholarship, scholarship, scholarship suggests that the number of women and men imported in this period was more or less equal, included high numbers of children. But before that, it was vast majority men. So when when black women come along and say, we were victims just like you, it's almost like they were right there with us you know, in, in, in 16, you know, 16, oh, uh, when we were, when we were first brought over and that's just not, that's just not correct. You know, that's in 1619, that's just not correct. Dr. Ronald Neal, you hadn't spoken in a while. What are your first thoughts listening to that? And you, you heard trans women, you heard black men oppressing black women. And when in this country, in the 500 years that we've been here, have black men hold the levers to power to control where black women are able to live, work, uh, eat, pray, uh, whether they can buy land or vote. We've never done that. Uh, but but go ahead, guys. It's, it's open. Uh, Doc, you can go and then uh, kosher clinician and then back to Tia Son Johnson and then uh, Green Gorilla. What are your thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Ronald Neal? Because I think it's that type of propaganda that allows them to maintain that victim status and, and get a pity party from everybody. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh... I mean, I would say that, you know, her, the, the first part of her analysis, um, I mean, it's not totally off. I mean, I mean, when she talks about the division, and so there, there clearly was a division in terms of uh, how men and women were dealt with. And so she's not she's not off uh, with, with that respect. Um, the problem is when you make a, a huge leap um, from that history, that anti-bellum anti history from that history of um, the first centuries of conquest, and you make that leap from there to the 21st century and attempt to make these um, parallels um, where there are no major differences between the two. Um, um, because what she perceives as the masculinization of black women today does not have the same type of consequences or effects that what she perceived uh, such masculinization um, in the anti bellum period to be in terms of how black women were treated. Okay. That is that, you know, we, we, we're different with two different histories. Um, and it's dangerous to play with history in that regard, but what she is doing, she's clearly trying to make this link. Um, but it is, it's a, I would say this, I mean, she is not completely wrong, but it is not a, an accurate, it is not a, um, complex reading of history is very selective and it's something that um, feminists have um, been adept at doing for for a very very long time in in terms of um, cherry picking history and reading it selectively and applying it in very very um, exaggerated ways to the present so is it fair to say basically what they're doing is they're mixing truth with lies and they're and this is how they, they, they're taking, you can't argue with, oh, slavery was bad. And then what they extract from slavery was bad is, oh, but it was worse for black American women. It was worse mm -hmm. for black men because not only the dominant society, white men, white women, but also black men oppressed us. And then what I think that happens, what happens if you do that, 
and I'll go to uh, Dr. T.S.I. Johnson. Then when black men said, well, you know, we were oppressed too. Yeah, but you oppressed them. So we're going to give them the double portion. We're going to give them the allotment that we had set aside to make you whole. And then we're going to give, um, we're going to give uh, them your allot. They're going to get their allotment and they're going to get your allotment because you were part and parcel of their oppression. It's the same thing we do in a court system. Somebody is involved in some sort of injury and you got three people. Yeah, these two are the major culprits, but this one helped. So we're going to take this and we're going to give that to you, but then we're also going to take a part of what they're entitled to and give it to them. You understand what I'm saying, Dr. T. S. Sign Johnson? Yeah, I mean, look, one of the things that we... we it's we it's have, pretty damn slick, if you ask me, but go ahead. Well, it is, and it, and it has a lot to do with what Dr. Neal was pointing out um, as far as... ...of consequences or... I'll go to uh, Dr. T. S. Sign Johnson. Then when black men said, well, you know, we were oppressed too. Yeah, but you oppressed them. So we're going to give them the double portion. We're going to give them the allotment that we had set aside to make you whole. And then we're going to give, um, we're going to give uh, them your lot. They're going to get their allotment and they're going to get your allotment because you were part and parcel of their oppression. It's the same thing we do in a court system. Somebody is involved in some sort of injury and you got three people. Yeah, these two are the major culprits, but this one helped. So we're going to take this and we're going to give that to you, but then we're also going to take a part of what they're entitled to and give it to them. You understand what I'm saying, Dr. T. S. Johnson? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, one of the things that we... we it's we it's have, pretty damn slick, if you ask me, but go ahead. Well, it is, and it, and it has a lot to do with what Dr. Neal was pointing out um, as far as how selective they're being, because they're transferring and, and, and performing a certain type of surgery on narratives, right? Mm. So you look at feminism, fem, what feminism, what Black feminists were able to do using feminism was to take white women's narrative of being abused and exploited by white men and transfer it to black women. So they transferred this narrative of male abuse and used that as an opportunity to advance themselves at the expense of black men. But there's no documented history where you have this established black male patriarchy that's the, supposed to be the source of all this oppression. One of the things that we, we, it's, we it's have- It's pretty damn slick if you ask me, but go ahead. Well, it is, and it, and it has a lot to do with what Dr. Neal was pointing out um, as far as how selective they're being, because they're transferring and, and, and performing a certain type of surgery on narratives, right? Mm. So you look at feminism, fem, what feminism, what Black feminists were able to do using feminism was to take white women's narrative of being abused and exploited by white men and transfer it to Black women. So they transferred this narrative of male abuse and used that as an opportunity to advance themselves at the expense of black men. But there's no documented history where you have this established black male patriarchy that's the, supposed to be the source of all this oppression. So instead of trying to find it, they just manufacture it, manufactured it via using white women's feminism as a, as a framework, as a narrative. And it was believable because so many of us grew up hearing about women's oppression in general. So by the time you get to a color purple, it's not a difficult leap for the average person to assume that black men via Danny Glover's mister are more oppressive than white men in slavery in general, right? Because this transfer is kind of taking place. This narrative seems pretty clean and straightforward and ergo all women are oppressed by all men anyway. Therefore, why wouldn't black women be doubly oppressed? And this is complicated that much further by the time you get to 1989 or so and Kimberly Crenshaw is pushing intersectionality, which basically codifies this transfer in a way that, that in an almost pseudoscientific narrative suggests that they are most oppressed on you know, race, class, sex, and gender axes. And therefore, um, we have to find ways to repair that narrative. This is why when you start talking about what BLM is doing with over $90 million that they've gotten just in the last year, mm -hmm. this is why they're able to get those kinds of resources and leverage it mainly to black LGBT organizations because these narratives have been used to such a degree that black men become almost irrelevant even when our deaths are the reason people are even paying attention to the conversation. But right? Doc, why don't, we, why don't we as black men do something about that. Like we can clearly see they're using our deaths to get rich and buy real estate and 
promote well, uh, an agenda for how, why don't we listen, stand up and do something about that? Because at this point, nearly 80% of the children are born to single mothers. So basically what you're talking about is, is contradicting and arguing with your mother and your grandmother, which we all know as black men in the black community is, is, is sacrilegious, right? You know, that's the way we're raised. So we're raised by the very women who are doing this. And we don't often know how to challenge each other. We challenge each other as men all the time. But when it comes to challenging women, we are wholly unprepared. And, and, and I would argue to some extent, white men don't fare much better, but they have a different narrative. You know, we, we have their narrative is rooted in a certain type of chivalry. So they have problems dealing with confronting women. Our narrative is rooted in our mothers teaching us about female superiority and male you know, inferiority. That conquer right. surf notion comes from that idea. We are right. lesser beings. So, you know, hmm. so, so that's what it was. Explain, so we have explain to, to us. And I mention you all the time. Can you explain to us how mothers go about, how black mothers go about doing that in the black community, please? And, and then we're going to go to the kosher clinic, the kosher clinician, and then back to G with the PhD. Go ahead. How do they, how do black mothers do that? What do they, what do they do to, to make us believe that we're conky serfs? What do they do to make us believe that we are a lesser class within the black community? How do they do that? Well, one of the things they do is prioritize the girls, especially when it comes to career, when it comes to, you know, heading the family. They prepare their girls for leadership. They prepare their boys for service. Mm -hmm. So boys come into it learning from direct relationships with their mother all the way to the women they grew up and, and tend to choose, which in many instances reflect their mother anyway. Uh, and, you know, this idea that your job is to serve and your job is to serve her emotional well-being as well as her physical needs. So you, 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 you really kind of come into this learning that the most you can really bring a woman is sexual uh, satisfaction and, and protection to some extent, but you are not in a decision-making capacity. You are not to be taken seriously. And in, in effect, ultimately, you are interchangeable. Mm. You are interchangeable. She can have several kids before you. she even marries you but it doesn't matter. She can replace you with another and or another if need be. This is what we're getting to at this point in society where in black community, where, you know, women can have children from whomever they choose to get sperm from, but he's not really central to the family because black men can be replaced. Black women cannot. The mother can't be replaced as far as the way we have framed this dynamic, but the father can. Is it blasphemy? And I'm going to ask the culture clinician, is it blasphemy to try to basically say, hey, she's just a woman. Yes, yeah, she's your mother. She's not a goddess. How do we begin to instill that? Because it's, this has become dangerous, in my opinion, because they're basically, in my opinion, and these are my words, black women are stealing resources away from black men that are supposed to be allotted for black men. They're stealing resources away from us and now our black boys are su suffering and as bgs itmore says this is why you have so many young black men kosher clinician that can't read that are right. kicked out of the house at 15 years old that have no that, that are homeless as, as 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 you brought up earlier as one of the panelists brought up earlier what do we do about that uh we have to begin to fight back and i think it goes again i tell these guys all the time you're soft you're nice you're sweet you need to be more the bad guy but how do we get these guys to man up? Let's take, for instance, this Goldman Sachs pledge of $10 billion, okay? Black women are like, yeah, 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 we got it. Now, when we had that My Brother's Keeper uh, uh, idea that was proposed by, by uh, former President Barack Obama, black women came out of the woodwork and said, oh, hell no, and they shot it down. I have heard yet to hear any black men who are coming and saying, oh, no, Goldman Sachs, you can't give $10 billion to those black women. We don't do that, but they do that to us. So what do we do about that, kosher clinician? And then we're going to go to the G with the PhD. Well, listen, this is a systematic process. It's not going to be eradicated overnight. I think what you guys are doing, you know, what I'm doing, what uh, Dr. Ron Neal, um, Green Gorilla, and Dr. T. Hassan Johnson is doing, we're having what's called, as I said earlier, uh, a spirit of universality. When men are coming together, once again, taking notes, sharing ideas, and then hopefully we can get it to the macro level, which is policy making. It, it probably won't happen because of liberal politics. But how about but, what, what do you think about a boycott of Goldman Sachs? 
or we're going to boycott you. How do you think that would go over in the black community if all of us here on YouTube, us Manosphere guys, Negro Manosphere, black Manosphere said, hey, you know what? We're boycotting Goldman Sachs because you didn't, de you didn't designate $10 billion for black men. How do you think that would go over in the black community? Well, it'll go back to being the victim paradox once again. You know, um, women, are, 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 it's, they can't help it. They're hardwired to be victims. You know, once again, if you look at the esoteric and not trying to push religion, Eve blamed the first man, Adam. But at the same time, men are wired to be, as Dr. Johnson called, concubines, or as I call it, the commodification of subjugation. We are wired to provide and protect, but we do it not based on principles. And see, it's a thinking error, um, Dennis. You talked about the simp chip. Um, but I call it the unconscious pathology or the or the conscious pathology of simping. And that that's a, that acronym means se sacrificing important masculine principles. And so men sacrifice important masculine principles because they like the tutelage of men like yourself and other men to teach them that they are worthy. And because of that, they've been hardwired through a system of matrilineal secession to adhere to the dogmas of their moms and still adhering to masculine principles that inspired them empower their self-esteem. A lot of men have low self-esteem. And I did, you know, what I'm doing as a clinical therapist out of, uh, out of pain to help these brothers get to the next level. So it's it's all in the wiring. It's part of their hard drive. Their hard drive is to be the victim. Our hard drive is to be um, the savior. But it's called thought thinking. We, we got to come up with things or acronyms that when we get tempted to provide and protect, we got to ask ourselves the question, how is this benefiting me? Because a lot of men are dying, they're going to the grave because they don't have principles that are predicated on helping them um, become better. So the way we get it done um, is to continue to work together as a team, to continue the conversation. I think it's at the grassroots level right now, but it's definitely morphing into something great. This is unparalleled, uh, in my opinion, in human history. It's, it's very unparalleled. And so, yeah, go ahead. No, well, I was going to ask the G, G with the PhD. Um, so... Uh, is it fair to say at this particular point in time in the United States, as far as the fight for resources allocated to the black community, uh, our adversary is our, these lovely ladies of ours? Is it fair to say that, G, with the PhD? Or if not, maybe I'm being too harsh. What are your thoughts? I don't think you're being harsh at all. I mean, look, intersectional feminism is about a fight for resources and jobs. And uh, that's exactly what it is. I mean, it, it doesn't get any deeper than that. That's exactly what it is. But uh, going back to comment on the lady's video, uh, you know, yeah. look, we just have to be realistic and accurate about how we portray slavery. I mean, one of the things that she did was she separated women from men in the experience of slavery. And, and it's true that like Ronald Neal, Dr. Ronald Neal said, men and women were treated differently but women, because they were the birthers of children, were given a privileged status over men. And, and look, all you got to do, so there's an article written by uh, a scholar, and one could argue he's one of the founding thinkers of black male studies. I mean, he's part of the canon of that field. And I mean, basically he says, look, the ordeal of slavery wrought many changes in the family of Afro-Americans, including the male and female roles. So the family life of the African model was basically patriarchal. The African model is patriarchal, although a lot of people would like to say it's matriarchal, okay? Um, but it became an impossibility when the slave's existence had to be basically devoted to the cultivation of tobacco and cotton. So the bond of selling of slaves basically is split up families. Mm -hmm. while uh, the maintenance of discipline on the plantation prevented the husband and the father from protecting his wife and his children against his white masters and other more favored slaves. Let's not get it twisted. Black women were not just field slaves. A lot of black women were house slaves and mammies, and they took care of children. And a lot of these women had preferred status on the plantation but we don't want to talk about that all we want to talk about is how men and women as slaves were treated exactly the same it's not the case okay it, it's, it's just not true and, and so it is a lie to some extent and it's in a what these women are doing is they're taking intersectionality and reading history from that lens so they what they're doing is morphing history to fit into 
their contemporary idea, uh, ideals and ideology. And mm -hmm. you can't do that, but I, there's further uh, things to say about this. Um, so there's financial value set on slaves' children, okay? And for women, when they were able to bear children, they were given cash and promotion from field slaves to house slaves. And this gave a high status to the woman to fit into their contemporary idea, uh, ideals and ideology. And mm -hmm. you can't do that, but I, there's further uh, things to say about this. Um, so there's financial value set on slaves' children. Okay. And for women, when they were able to bear children, they were given cash. and promotion from field slaves to house slaves. And this gave a high status to the woman. Okay, a status which the father could never enjoy unless he was basically a stud. Okay. And this led to the breaking of family ties and the degradation of the family even further. So under conditions of slavery, the American black father was forcefully deprived of, of the responsibilities and privileges of fatherhood. And, you know, we, we wanted to stay together, but the economic interest of slave owning prevented it. So the only thing that was at, that that had any consistency was the mother child bond right and they wanted to resist the mother and child bond was a way to try to resist uh against the disruptive economic interest of slavery but 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 look women were given the head of the household status because you know who the mother is, you don't know who the father is, especially mm -hmm. if you, you're forcing people to mate like animals. And, and there was a lot of forced to penetration sexual abuse going on for men as well as for women. There were economic interests of slave owning prevented it. So the only thing that was at, that, that had any consistency was the mother-child bond, right? And they wanted to resist the mother and child bond was a way to try to resist uh, against the disruptive economic interest of slavery. But, but, but look, women were given the head of the household status because you know who the mother is, you don't know who the father is, especially mm -hmm. if you, you're forcing people to mate like animals. And, and there was a lot of forced to penetration sexual abuse going on for men as well as for women. There were acts where men were forced to have sex with women. They didn't even want to, but they had to because they were dominated. But, but these are the kind of things that are, that are never discussed because we're only seeing the world through this feminist lens. There are only, well, only their views are being registered. And, and at some point, the experiences, the phenomenal, uh, phenomenological experiences of black men have to be registered into the account as well. And they're not. And Why I'm is it? Pause with. And I'm pissed off about it. I'm pretty mad about it, man. I understand, and I want to ask anybody can answer this question. And I know Dr. Tia Son Johnson has talked about this often. Why is it that black men are never seen as victims? So no matter if it's Trayvon Martin, 
uh, or any other other black men who are killed on TV, uh, killed on and, and it's recorded and played over and over. Why are we not seeing as victims? And if, if somebody can explain that for me, and and then also the next part of that question is how do we begin to undo this 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 or uh, undo the effects of this victim goddess complex that has basically allow black women to absorb all the resources and all and maintain the social status and the hierarchy that we have in the black community. Because as you, as you gentlemen have pointed out, you know, with black women being in charge, you know, over the past 50 years, specifically raising single black boys, they got a lock on their brains. And by the time we get it, we're, we're remediating as opposed to raising. Who wants to take that question? Anybody, the floor is open. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, go ahead, go ahead, Don. Oh, well, it, look, I'll just say very quickly, you, it, it, from white society to black feminism, and they use the same talking points and the same pseudoscience. If you check some of the more recent works by Dr. Tommy Curry, he actually illustrates how black feminists got their theories, ideologies, and whatnot about black men. They pulled them from white uh, pseudoscientific writings, essays, research, as it were, uh, that that framed us as essentially, you know, monsters for the most part. Effects of this victim goddess complex that has basically allowed black women to absorb all the resources and all and maintain the social status and the hierarchy that we have in the black community. Because as you as you gentlemen have pointed out, you know, with black women being in charge, you know, over the past 50 years, specifically raising single black boys. They got a lock on their brains, and by the time we get it, we're, we're, we're remediating as opposed to raising. Who wants to take that question? Anybody? The floor is open. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, go ahead, go ahead, Don. Oh well, it, look, oh. I'll just say very quickly: you, it, it, from white society to black feminism, and they use the same talking points and the same pseudoscience. If you check some of the more recent works by Dr. Tommy Curry, he actually mm -hmm. illustrates how black feminists got their theories, ideologies and whatnot about black men. They pulled them from white uh, pseudoscientific writings, essays, research, as it were, uh, that, that framed us as essentially, you know, monsters for the most part. So the, from white society to black feminists within the black community, this idea of black men being monsters is so pervasive that it, you know, it, it, it's not surprising that you, that people don't really empathize with black men as victims, even as children, even as young as three years old, we're seen to be about four and a half years older than we are. A lot of that comes from these narratives that objectify black men as villainous, as you know, vicious, as 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 dangerous, even on sexual terms. So so you know, we can be seen on television being shot up and killed, and you know whatnot. So that we're victims to that extent, but it's not surprising that people don't empathize uh, with black men necessarily, which is why, you know, the equity of those murders and those deaths don't tend to benefit black men themselves. Every other so, group can benefit off our deaths, but us. So, Doctor, is that why she would bring up a uh, a young woman, Megan The Stallion, who has a record of being a domestic abuser against her her husband or, or her her former boyfriend, and mm -hmm. then make her to be the victim when, in actuality, she was the perpetrator? Now, we don't know the story behind this newest incident, but we know she was arrested for that last one. Is that is that why she would? basically bring that up and flaunt us in our face that, because no one would ever believe yeah. that her big black boyfriend could ever uh, be the victim. Well, that, that's, I, I don't know if I've caught up on something recent or something new happened. I'm not familiar with it, but she, she had an issue with some rapper from Canada, another black boy who's now Tory a Lanes. victim. Tory Lanez, right. Oh, uh, is, I thought, okay, so this is from what, last year? So basically, she had an issue with Tory Lanez. The facts are still out. We don't know. But if you look at her record, she had an issue while she was in college dating her former boyfriend. And the police arrested her because she was the aggressor in the attack. 
Oh and yeah. And so yeah. It's, okay. it, it's and so but but even though this young woman decides to get on our, on there and point her out as being the victim as opposed to a two-time domestic abuser. Can you right. imagine if there was a black man with two separate incidents? They no, were already they would skew it in by now. A absolutely. And and it's primarily through feminism that she's able to do it because feminism was an on ramp ramp for black women to be able to transfer some of that. I at least the association of femininity and womanhood to black women to some extent. Right. The video we watched the you know, she's very she cherry picked a lot of the history, but she's not incorrect about the perception of black women. They were not perceived as women any more than black men were perceived as men. But what they were able to do through feminism, especially in the 1970s and 80s, was transfer some some identity, some identification of femininity to them. So you can have a, a, a Megan the Stallion stand up and say, look, I was a victim. Look how I was treated. I'm a woman. I'm delicate, so on and so forth. And it has some kind of traction, more so than it would have 100 years prior or 150 years prior mainly because of that that identification with white women women and intersectionality but it, it does obscure which is what she i think is doing uh her her you know any accountability on her part for the abuse that she and others may you know extend to black men but they know they can do that because most black men are not seen as human all right and so i got another question and that's that's a lot and people are going to be looking at this for years this particular video i got another one why would she throw in, and anybody can, anyone, any one of you all who want to touch this, why would she throw in trans men? What does that have to do with, I don't get that. Can somebody explain that to me, please, or explain that to everybody? Because why would that even, because those, those are in essence men, right? So how does that work? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me, let, let me weigh in on this one, right? Because, yes, you know, yes, um, look, the extent to which you identify with, as a woman, gives yep. you entryway yep. into feminism. That's yep. just the short and tall of it. So yep. if, if you say, okay, well, I'm a woman, I identify with womanhood and femininity, then all of a sudden you are shoehorned yes. into preferred status uh, uh, related to uh, intersectional feminism. Now, I don't know if that would have been the case with second wave feminism and even fourth and fifth wave feminism This is moving into this new phase uh, because there are some feminists who are saying that uh, you know, it's unfair uh, for women who are not cisgendered, you know, uh, to all of a sudden uh, enjoy the privileges and the benefits that, you know, real women uh, fought for. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, ultimately, if you are a trans, and the reason why is because second wave feminism and third wave feminism was largely brought into prominence by LGBTQ women. Okay, so they identify with with uh, trans women, uh, more you don't see all of this, you know, uh, uh, all of this prefer preferential status for trans men. You you don't hear them talk about trans men. I mean, I I've very rarely heard them talk about trans men. Okay, but they do talk a lot about trans women, and so uh, but but ultimately, um, they again just to echo what I said before. The extent to which they identify as women, they're given preferential status. That's just the short and tall of it. You don't have to make it more complex than what it is. That's just what it is. And can I can I add to that? Of course, doctor. Go ahead. You no, know, because Gigi is definitely correct. And I, the other piece I want to add is something we even heard the woman in the video say. She when she was trying to define how difficult black female life was, she talked about it by male terms. She talked about it in terms of how these women were treated like black men. Notice she said that? You'll, uh -huh. you'll, you'll see that same kind of narrative in a different kind of way when it comes to trans and LGBT, especially, so you talk about trans, both, both trans women and men, when you look at the extent to which they're aggressed upon, it's based on their masculinity. You talk about trans women, the real threat to trans women, remember the whole issue a few years ago about bathrooms and who should use what bathrooms? The the biggest fear people had were men or trans women, right? Men, those who were born biologically male, that they may rape girls and women in female bathrooms. And ba you know, that was the big fear. So it came down to the masculine component. When you talk about trans men, 
Gigi is right. Nobody really talks about trans men. But what we notice is that when trans men are aggressed upon, even if it's by the police, they're aggressed upon because they're assumed to be men. Mm. So, so you know, whether you're talking about how you define oppression during slavery or whether you talk about these new sexual identities, you notice how it keeps coming back to a certain type of misandry in each context. It has to do with the hatred of men, black men in particular. That's the defining marker to a lot of this. How do we, okay, we got about, and I know you, you doctors are busy. I know you all are busy. And I want to just thank you on behalf of my guys here and, and the folks who follow this page. Thank you for your time. I want to spend in this last 12 minutes, I want some answers. How do we begin to undo this female goddess complex that has served Black American women so well and ripped resources and social status from Black fathers, uh, Black boys, that, 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 and, and Black men in general that's violently necessary? How do we begin to get it back? I think there's a psychological point of, 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 of a component to it, but also I think there's some things that we need to begin to do. Yes, we're talking on the internet. Yes, we're talking about it. Yes, we're now acknowledging it. Um, I, what do we begin to do to undo this? Because they're stealing resources away from us, and they're not going to give it back. As anybody knows who studies history, once vested in power, it's damn near impossible to get folks to give it up without a fight. What do we do? Man, I think Ronald Neal's got the answer to that. Ronald BMI, <laughs> BMA, <laughs> BME. And, and, and not only that, but I'm going to let him speak, but the biggest deal with black men is knowing that they do not need permission to speak. Mm -hmm. They don't need permission right. to be angry. Mm -hmm. They don't need permission to talk about their experiences and to let it all out on the table. Because mm -hmm. far too long, we've been bottled up. We haven't said anything and have given, given deferential treatment to women. We've given deferential treatment to our sisters, our mothers, our aunties, our cousins, our daughters, but now it's time to say, look, I'm not a hero for everybody at all right. times. If I can't take care of myself, I can't take care of anybody else. You understand? So, doc so, so doctor, are you, are you saying it's fair for men, fair for black men to begin to put themselves number one and say no? Put yourself in put yourself in the number one position because nobody right. else will. Right. Right. Everybody who heard that, all you guys, make sure you hit the number one button. Like I always say, put yourself number one. And then also as as doctors, as 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 Green Gorilla, the G with the PhD said, it's okay to say no to mama and auntie and, and whatnot. But Dr. Ronald O'Neill, please go ahead and elaborate on that. What do you, what do, what do we do now to un uh, to 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 demystify the Scottish complex and throw some facts on the victim status and and stop allowing Black American women to steal resources designated for the Black community and it, it, but they don't. That, that and also designated for black men that they steal away from us. What do we do here? What, how do we, what do we do? I mean, what, how much, what do we have to do? I think, um, I mean, what we're doing now, man, and, um, and that is to public. You know, I'm going to sue somebody, man. I'm going to try to do something, man. What's yeah, happening, I, I, man? Go I got you. I got you. But, yeah. but publicly, we have to dismantle these ideas. And publicly, we have to um, deconstruct the psychology within Black men um, that contributes to the persistence of these ideas. Um, and we have to, in, in, you know, Couple with all I've just said, man, really attack attack these ideologies. Um, we are in an ideological war, okay? And we have to be clear about what that means and what that is. Um, we have to be direct. Um, we have to be aggressive about it. And, and I, I've said this on my platform, um, you know, just as Jews, and I've said it here, uh, the last time we were together, just as Jews in this country and around the world, attack anti-Semitism. They do it 
uh, you know, philosophically, they do it legally, they do it in so many ways. We have to uh, similarly um, attack all of this uh, nonsense, okay? Well, see, Doc, here's, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing, and we had, I had a family law here yesterday, a family law lawyer here yesterday. He's a young lawyer out of Atlanta, his name is the lead attorney. His biggest problem is trying to get his, his, his male clients not to be simps because they don't want to go after or treat the women in their life who've given birth to them or not given birth, who've, who've given birth to their children. They don't want to attack them. And so basically what we're doing here is we're asking men to speak up for themselves against their adversary. But this is not the amorphous white man that you used to do. We're asking mm -hmm. them to say, hey, your sisters, your lovely ladies, your mama, your auntie, your wife, your girlfriend, is, is is she has something that belongs to you and you gotta go get it. Your social status, uh, your your you gotta instead of saying no, we're not going to send Keisha to school, we're gonna send Laron to school. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or they're gonna have to both get jobs. We're not gonna make it easy for her and make it hard for him. We're not just gonna throw him to the wind. How do we get these black men, these simps? Because we've all been raised as simps by our mothers. And and, and credit, the, uh, you, you know, Dr. Kosher, uh, uh, Kosher Clinician tried to give me more credit. I'm a simp, too. I'm a recovering simp. But I'm a simp <laughs> nonetheless. Now I'm I a still, recovering I, simp, my dear. <laughs> got to skip back in there. Ah, it's, it's, it's buzzing. Mm. How, do we get, how do we do that? Because we've been, we've been trained not to. We've been programmed not to even think about telling mama she's wrong, to even thinking about denying them anything. And how dare we get on TV and say, hey, you know what? You guys are giving $10 billion to black women. Hell with you and hell with what they talking about. You better get some of that to us or we done. How do we convince these black men, these simps? And I love us, but how do we convince us to do that? Yeah, well, you know, I think, you know, one way, one strategy is to look at what we're dealing with as just an offshoot. I've said this before, other places, um, of white supremacy, that white supremacy works through women. It works through black women. And Ooh, it impacts- Oh, no, uh, you didn't say that. Say it again. Say it again and explain it. That, 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 that white supremacy works through women. And white supremacy shows up in our interactions with women. And so when we talk about, know, I think, you know, one way, one strategy, is to look at what we're dealing with as just an offshoot. And I've said this before, other places, um, of white supremacy, that white supremacy works through women. They work through black women. And Ooh, it impacts- Oh, no, uh, you didn't say that. Say it again, say it again, explain it. That, is, that, yeah, that white supremacy works through women and white supremacy shows up in our interactions with women. And so when we talk about the family courts and what, you know, the lead attorney is concerned with, we're talking about, you know, exactly that. And what we have to get black men to understand, see, it's not, not that we're, we're attacking women, we're talking that we're, we're attacking the, the person of black women or we're targeting black women. We are, we are, we are attacking the source of their animosity and their uh, vitriol toward us, okay? So, I, I mean, in one of my videos, I talk, talked about misandry as wickedness and evil. Wickedness and evil that's being, um, you know, uh, operationalized through women. Now, I'm not saying that women are wicked and evil, that they're inherently wicked and evil, but I'm saying that the misandry, the utter hatred of black men, which is a subsidiary of white supremacy, that's where its root is, it's wicked and evil. And so when we understand a larger framework, a bigger picture, that black women have been conditioned, they have been socialized to see us in a particular kind of way. Uh, we, we, we understand that we're not talking about their character, we're not talking about anything that's inherent. We are talking, of, talking about just the larger system, that they are mirrors of America, and that's what we're, we're attacking. So when we attack the misandry that comes from them, we are also attacking the larger edifice of misandry that's coming uh, from white society. So I, I think that's the, that's the best way to frame it. But here's the thing, feminist legal policy, what feminists have been able to do in corporate America could not happen without media. 
without the image, without the word, without people in the public, without the TV shows, without voices, without women constantly talking, 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 particular kind of way, uh, we, we, we understand that we're not talking about their character. We're not talking about anything that's inherent. We are talking, of, talking about just the larger system, that they are mirrors of America. And that's what we're, we're attacking. So when we attack the misandry that comes from them, we are also attacking the larger edifice of misandry that's coming uh, from white society. So I, I think that's the, that's the best way to frame it. But here's the thing. Feminist legal policy, what feminists have been able to do in corporate America could not happen without media, without the image, without the word, without people in the public, without the TV shows, without voices, without women constantly talking, 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 talking. And so what we have to get black men to understand is important to no longer be silent, to attack these ideas right. in the public right. domain, to not be fearful. So, so here's the other, the other thing is that you have so many, and, and I've said this particularly to black men who are professional, uh, who are in the middle to upper class, even in 1%, those who have been silent, those who just, you know, have resigned themselves to just, um, you know, being anonymous. Those black men in particular need to, 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 to take a stance. And to, and, and, and to put put something on the line, to take risk. All right, all right. We need we need more people like Dennis Sperling, more people like the mm -hmm. uh, the lead attorney. You need more mm -hmm. brothers who are um, who, who have some uh, uh, deep cachet in American society who can speak to these issues. All of us. I have a PhD, T.S. on Johnson, the clinical uh, the, the coach clinician. I mean, we're all certified people. The G with the PhD, we are all here doing this. We need more black men at the highest levels of society to open their mouths. All right, That's thank it. you. Before, okay. before we go, we got to do a little commercial, not commercial. You guys get the likes up. We got 422 people in the chat room. We got 241 likes. Hit the number one button, hit the thumbs up button, because I know you guys are enjoying this. This is food that we're going to be breaking this down for months. But uh, hit the thumbs up button. Go ahead, hit the thumbs up button. Now, I'm not going to run any commercials. You already know the drill. Hit the number one button. Hit the thumbs up button. Dr. T.S. I think that was Dr. T.S. Johnson. Look, I want you to follow up on that, but tell me this, because there's another component to you. Because not only are you dealing with black women, but you're also dealing with the white knights among us mm -hmm. who will say, no, you can't <laughs> say that to her. You wrong for that. How do we deal with these queen worshipers that we have amongst us? Hit the thumbs up button and doc go ahead and go well first of all we we gotta the environment is gonna do a lot of the work for us mm -hmm. because whether you agree with these concepts or not even the hardcore hardest simp you'll ever meet will still put on a condom before he has sex because he knows he might get her pregnant he'll still wonder about getting married because he knows she can take him to court and clean him out the environment is what it is whether you like what's coming from the manosphere or not now, what, what I think Dr. Neal is pointing to is we got to, you know, we got to continue to create the vocabulary, the concepts, the ideas, and put them out there for consumption so we can break them down and then begin to use them when we craft our strategy on how to act. We, it has to be based on something more than just anger. It has to be based on an understanding of what's going on, <clears throat> and that will complement Right. It will complement the environment in a way where more and more brothers will come in here and even more women. I've been noticing that, too, will come in and say, you know what? I never thought of it this way before, but I'm seeing it. So I'm going to give you three concepts just to, to end off with today very quickly. The first one actually comes from Dr. Tommy Curry. And one of his recent papers, it was entitled Racism as Misandric Aggression. So basically what he's saying is the very thing that we've all grown up with, you know, with an understanding of racism is actually not the way we think about it. It's not just racism against the whole color. It's actually very targeted at the males mm. and it always has been. So what he's trying to get us to do is to reframe the very idea of racism, not as just, you know, discrimination against the color, but discrimination, a very targeted discrimination against men. Black men in this instance, we're talking about the black community. The other concept I'll give you is black male dual economy, right? One of the things that I've been trying to get people to understand is in this last few weeks, what we've seen happening 
with the millions, if not billions of dollars that have been thrown at black women and black women, especially if you look at say BLM are already delegating those dollars, but only to other black women and LGBT. What we're noticing is this, this contributes to what I've called the black male dual economy. Black males live a very different economy than even our women do. It's an economy that doesn't allow us access that is far more challenging and disruptive to black life, but it, it's particularly, again, targeted at the males in, in a different term. The last concept, which is tied to this, is what I call social, uh, social gentrification or anti-black misandric social gentrification. And basically what that means is that as these dollars are being given to women and women are primarily spending it on themselves, they are ensuring for the next generation that those who will be propped into the elite that much faster from within the black community are other women and LGBT. So we have a targeted agenda from within the community to underdevelop black men for future generations. You talk about the money that BLM alone has gotten, even if we just looked at last year, you're talking close to $100 million. In a poor community, that is huge. And it is earmarked specifically for black women, despite that it was brought about from black male debt. So what I'm pointing to you with these three concepts, racism as misandric aggression, black male dual economy, or the anti-black misandric social gentrification, each of these concepts highlights a different area of, of how black men are targeted and underdeveloped from outside of the community and from within it. We have to be able to take these concepts, understand them, interpret it in the context of our own individual life experiences, and then use them when we develop strategies for action. All right, thank, thank you guys. Hey, hey, look, I got Go one more thing to say myself. Uh, you know, okay, look. yes, sir, Doc. You guys uh, hit the like button, hit the number one button, hit the number one button for the G with the PhD, Dr. Ron O'Neill, Dr. Tia Sean Johnson, and the kosher clinician. I have posted each one of their YouTube pages. And I expect everybody in here to join their pages right now. Anybody who watches this, I want you to make sure you click and, and, and subscribe to their pages. They are all in the uh, chat room right now. That is your obligation. I want you to click and make sure you do that. In the meantime, hit the number one button. Also hit the thumbs up button for each one of these doctors for taking their time out. Dr. Uh, the G with the PhD, I apologize for interrupting, but go ahead and go. So one term I have is called racial hypergamy. Uh, mm. You know, uh, it, it's connected to this idea of hypergamy where women, you know, they monkey branch and they go out to do what's best for themselves. Uh, I consider what you see uh, being conducted by black women now, uh, particularly uh, black women who consider themselves to be feminists, uh, they're engaged in what I call racial hypergamy, whereby they use the system of racism and white supremacy, like Dr. Ronald O'Neill was talking about earlier, and they use it to gain benefits for themselves. Whether they're doing it consciously or unconsciously, doesn't matter. Because yes, everyone in this culture has been uh, programmed to believe that black men are boogeymen, including black men. Yep. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. but but the the other piece to this is a woman will police your body without any inhibitions whatsoever, whenever they feel like it. Mm. So you better understand that if, if they are willing and ready to push the panic button, you better be ready and willing to push the panic button as well. You better be able to use the law to the fullest extent. We want to be able to deal cooperatively with our sisters, okay? But if they don't want to play nice, well, we got to play tit for tat. It's just as simple as that. If you don't want to play nice and you don't want to cooperate, and you want to play this racial hypergamous game, then guess what we got for you? We're going to play the same game until you start playing nice again. That means I'm cutting you off. If you right. touch me, I'm calling the police. Right, if right. you got my kid and you're doing something foul, I'm reporting it. Okay? Uh, it just is what it is. If you're using these tactics, I'm going to use the same tactics that you're using. It's going to be tit for tat until you start playing nice again. It's, a, it's an operative strategy within most biological organisms that exist on planet Earth. You don't play nice, we don't play nice with you. But you, have to, be, you have to be smart about it, though. But, <laughs> but, but, you, but you know what happens when they, when they do that, uh, uh, Attorney Sperling? When, when, when you start to push back, 
the first yeah. thing you'll start to hear is, well, you know what? We have to fix this. The community mm -hmm. has to come together. You'll right. notice that, brothers in the manosphere, <laughs> before you started speaking up, all of us would hear women just berating us. And when brothers mm -hmm. started responding with data and with mm -hmm. arguments, now all of a sudden you started hearing people say, well, you know what? We have to work together. We have to compromise. But we didn't have to compromise before black men started saying something. Mm. So G is I absolutely right. That? What should our response be to that? Oh, but we're we're all in this together for something they did. What should, what should our response? Be? <laughs> our response should be to come up with comprehensive standards. You know, I think I like what Brother Ron Neal said. The 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 whole epigenesis of what he's talking about, black male independence. In my mind, part of that is divestment, and that divestment is saying either give me liberty or give me death. If if she's not adhering to your expectations, you have to leave her alone. You divest. And you cooperate, or you find you leave your mama alone, though. Bro. Man, listen, listen. How I love... you leave your your wife, your girlfriend, your baby? How do you leave them alone? Well, because those are the ones that got the hooks in. Because they don't have any hooks in me. You gotta know what your purpose is. They don't have no <laughs> hooks in me. I'll check my mom. I check my wife. I check my sisters. I, I don't. I don't. I don't bow to no man, but I definitely don't bow to women. And I'm not saying that to be misogynistic. But you're, but, you're, but Doc, kosher clinician, you're <laughs> asking these right. men to right. tell God no. That is blasphemy. <laughs> well, 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 listen, the, the, the first stage in overcoming is you have to be aware of the psychopathology called denial. So first you got to overcome the psychopathology called denial. A lot of men are in denial about female nature. But once you can overcome that, and, and what we're doing through this group catharsis, that's when true change is going to take place. And, and even in this universality of brotherhood, uh, Brother Dennis, uh, we're still in the no the storming stage of development. We still got inroads to to break. But this is a good this is a great experiment. I call it a social phenomenon because it's never happened before in the annals of human history, in my mind. So it's more or less what Dr. Neil's saying: stand firm on principles, stand firm on yourself, come up with um, what we got to continue to do is teach these young men like the elders did, and and and, and divest. Because look, we go. I'm a, yeah. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Okay, so okay, you got mommy in check, but what are you gonna do when your uncles and your brothers and your nephews all come look, man? You was wrong for that. And then they begin to ostracize you from the family and treat you bad because you're standing up for what you believe is right, for your manhood, basically for your social status against the goddess. How do you you're making mama who's the goddess a victim, more of a victim than she already? How do you do that? Well, I, well, I listen. Mean, I thought it I call mm -hmm. it BMI, black male independence. Right, right. I call right. it having a I'm I call it having a zero tolerance policy. Yes, sir. For exactly. Misandry. Exactly. Yes, sir. Zero yes, tolerance sir. Right. for anti-black misandry. And that right. includes mm -hmm. that includes that includes black men. Okay? Right. Let, let me give you an example. Do you all see what's happening with, with brother Kwame Brown? Yeah. The basketball mm -hmm. player. Yeah, I've seen it. And he, he's been clapping back. At, at Stephen Jackson and, and those guys, um, those those sports casters, what's the thing, Stephen Smith and the other people, he's mm -hmm. been talking about black men who are in high level sports who do commentary, all right, who pathologize on a consistent basis other black men who are mm -hmm. in sports. And mm -hmm. Kwame Brown, he's got streams all over YouTube right now where he's clapping back. He's been listening to the black manosphere. Mm. And he has right. he is enacting and he is he is practicing this zero tolerance policy. You are yes. not going to sit back on you're not gonna sit on these platforms, Stephen Jackson and, and those guys, um, those those sports casters, what's the thing, Stephen Smith and the other people. He's mm -hmm. been talking about black men who are in high level sports who do commentary, all right, who pathologize on a consistent basis other black men who are in mm -hmm. sports. And mm -hmm. Kwame Brown, he's got streams all over YouTube right now. Well, he's clapping back. He's been listening to the black manosphere. Mm -hmm. And he has, right. he is enacting, and he is he is practicing this zero tolerance policy. You are yes. not going to sit back on, you're not going to sit on these platforms and talk about black men. I don't care if it, if it comes to other black men. He's, he's going at Charlemagne the God. He's going at DJ Envy. He's going at all mm -hmm. these people Jamel who are going Hill. at black men. Mm -hmm. That is the zero tolerance policy. And right. that's what black men, black men who are serious about black male independence must engage in. So if it means that we are, if it means that we are unpopular with our brothers, 
our biological brothers or our uncles or our cousins, if it means that we are unpopular with our sisters, our, our daughters, or what have you, so be it. We have to have an uncompromising stance. That is the only way that you get respect in any culture. But Dr. Neal, how are we going to do that without, and if I could bring a term up from plantation politics, how are we going to do that without being labeled the crazy N-word? Oh, that yeah. N-word crazy. And being ostracized and made to seem as though what we have to say is just so far out there that it should be a uh, 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 disregard. Because that's basically what's going to happen. Oh, he's just crazy. As opposed to he's the example. Oh, no, he's the one you shouldn't follow. How do we do that? How do we make it so common? that black men stand up for themselves and black, we put up a front. You don't need a leader. You don't need a, you don't need a, 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 a committee. We just do it because we see it happening and we attack it just like white blood cells in the body. How do we make that so common practice in our culture amongst black men? How do we do that? Brother, I, I, I get emails, I get messages from people telling me I'm crazy all the time. Okay. Um, and um, I'm, all, I'm sure this I'm, this panel of black men, we all get that. Trust I'm, me, you, I'm, I'm, I'm a trial, I'm, I'm a I'm a I'm a trial lawyer dependent on the public, and the, uh, a majority or at least a large portion of my clientele is black folks, and the typical decision makers are the lovely ladies who I'm always scolding here on my page for their bad <laughs> behavior. So yes, I, I I get it, but go ahead, Doc. No, I mean we, you just have to you know you know I, I embrace the crazy uncle. Uh, label, okay? I mean, there's there's no other way around it. I mean, if we're going to push this thing and be serious about this, because they're not going to, I mean, the, the, the depths of misandry, I mean, it, it is so far-reaching and so all-encompassing in terms of how it takes hold of the, the human psyche, okay? That, of course, you're going to have pushback. Of course, people are not going to understand, but you got to continue to articulate this this perspective. And, 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 and continue to push back against this this hatred of black men, and that's just that's just the price that you pay. Being unpopular, uh, not being liked, that's just the cost of doing business. And I think black men, if, if you want to really get that simp out of you, you have to come to terms with that. Yeah, but you, right, you, you can go ahead, and, Doc. Of course, Doc. I, yeah, I, I think we also have to adjust our expectations. Everybody ain't gonna agree. And so we need to go into this knowing that everybody ain't going to agree, and that's okay. Because right. we really only need a certain percentage of folk, a small percentage at that, but to push for transformation. Like any organization I've worked in, it wasn't the hundreds of people in the organization that got shit done. It was the five to ten people that were the right. most serious. Right, so right. as far as I'm concerned, we got to adjust our expectation and come into this knowing that everybody ain't going to agree. But here's the other twist to it. I do get the you're crazy, you know, letters, but you know what I also noticed, I started to get in the last couple of years uh, uh, across uh, across race even, but uh, definitely across age, across class, from white collar to blue collar to unemployed, men and women. I get black folk that'll reach out to me and say, you know what, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I get black men <laughs> who have been fighting me for years. I just mm -hmm. got a call last night from mm -hmm. a brother who's been fighting me for years. Right. And he <clears throat> called me and said, you know what, Doc? Mm -hmm. You were right. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. He's you right. Were right. And no he started doubt. he right. started recounting stories. Mm -hmm. That is the trick. He mm -hmm. started recounting stories of things he's experienced his entire life, mm -hmm. but he never saw it from the vantage point that we talk about it until he was forced to. Right. You know right. what I mean? But I have women that'll do the same. Mm -hmm. Mothers, most especially, that'll call me out the blue or write me and say, you know what, I have seen what you're talking about happening to my son. Hell, we watch Kevin Samuels. How many women have called in and said, you know what, I used to disagree, but I realize you have a point and right. I've done this. I mean, mm -hmm. I've even had women who are abusers reach mm -hmm. out and say, you know what, I didn't think it was abuse, but I did hit and beat up on my husband and blah, blah, blah. And I called the police uh -huh. on him. And I didn't realize how bad what I was doing was. It was just what my mother and grandmother taught right. me I could do. Right, so, right. you know, we, we're going to have allies that come from strange places. Mm -hmm. But as long as we have a, sm a small percentage uh, who are willing to do the work, that's all we got to do. Well, listen, and, and, and let me just say this before yeah, we go, go, ahead. go, on. go, ahead, go ahead. Most men at one time or another have suffered an injustice mm -hmm. at the hands of women. Right. You got a whole cadre of men out here who will talk about these issues in the barbershop. They'll talk about these issues in the bar while they're smoking cigars. It's time for you to come out from underneath your 
you know, your shell. It's time for you to come out and start speaking. And, you know, I'm just going to tell you to listen to Outcast Roses, man. I know you like to thank your S don't stink, but lean mm. a little bit closer, see? Roses really do smell like boo-boo. You're mm. not perfect. You're not God. We don't live in ancient African civilization where mm -hmm. there's a pantheon of black women and, and men, male gods. We don't have that. We live in the United States in 2021. And here's the deal. You're a fallible being. We're fallible beings as well. But to try to put on this God complex on us, no, it ain't going to happen today. Well, 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 from the clinical lens, we have to stop feeding the narcissistic supply. You got to stop feeding that narcissistic supply. And that ties back to what Dr. Ronald Neal says about black male independence in my best estimation, I could be wrong, but you have to stop feeding that narcissistic supply. And as Dr. Johnson say, time is the greatest teacher. You have to teach them, divest, and just keep pushing forward. One will chase a thousand to flight, two games can chase, chase 10,000 to flight. We got more than two, we got five. And yes, how do we, we, yeah, go ahead, how do we stop feeding that narcissist? What are we doing? How are we feeding it? And how do we divest? Go ahead, uh, well, position. How well, do we, we stop feeding that narcissist? Well, we, 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 we are feeding to do our own unconscious pathology of minimization, where we're minimizing our own essence and mm. the uh, aggrandizement of them. So I break start, that down yeah. for, for, for on an eighth grade level so everybody can feed in their narcissistic supply. You got to stop feeding that narcissistic supply. And that ties back to what Dr. Ronald Neal says about black male independence in my best estimation, I could be wrong, but you have to stop feeding that narcissistic supply. And as Dr. Johnson say, time is the greatest teacher. You have to teach them, divest, and just keep pushing forward. One will chase a thousand to flight, two games can chase, chase 10,000 to flight. We got more than two, we got five. And yes, how do we, yeah, go ahead, how do we stop feeding that narcissist? What are we doing? How are we feeding it? And how do we divest? Go ahead, uh, well, position. How well, do we, we stop feeding that narcissist? Well, we, 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 we are feeding to do our own unconscious pathology of minimization, where we're minimizing our own essence and mm. the uh, aggrandizement of them. So I break start, that down yeah. for, for, for on an eighth grade level so everybody can understand what you're doing. <laughs> right, so, so, so basically, stop making them, start loving yourself and stop pumping their head. Stop boosting their head up. Start loving yourself, stop boosting their head up, and start coming up with comprehensive standards that, that are going to benefit you. That's what you have to start doing. Once you start doing that and you start loving yourself, then mm -hmm. they'll get the picture. You know, we I'm about to go on the tour next week um, in, in, in a foreign country. I ain't never done it before, and I'm going to take notes. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm going to take notes, and we're going to be like the 20 watchers, and we're going to come back and we're going to report what we've seen. <laughs> like okay. in the book of Enoch. <laughs> Ooh, that might be another conversation I'd like to get you gentlemen well, back. How well, is uh, well, brothers well. traveling overseas affecting the uh, what's going on here? But we're going to save know, that for another time. But well, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but you, you're you hitting on something, Attorney Sperling, that, that needs to be talked about. I did a couple of shows with BGS looking at, you know, feminine archetypes uh -huh. and whatnot. And one of the things that I have noticed, and I think we all have, is this rhetoric about the goddesses. For right. many women, it's not rhetoric. For many women, they are serious about this. That's you know, true. And, there's, and, they've, and one of the things I, I had, a, I talked about this a couple, a few shows, a couple weeks ago, and I was talking about the uh, the show American Gods, mm -hmm. you know, and, and one of the things I noticed this this particular season that just ended is they finally brought on some Marishas, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I started to comment on was how I've noticed that there is this cadre of black women that practice you know, the Orisha worship or Ifa, mm -hmm. but they only focus on the feminine deities. Mm -hmm. And when I started to put that out there, I started to notice, you know, because it was it was tied into a conversation about, you know, a certain type of feminism that's taken over Christianity, where mm -hmm. men have left the church in large right. numbers. Right. So right, now right. so so you have a feminine influence Christianity that's heavily rooted in prosperity gospel mm -hmm. that is ideologically changing the face of the church. And then when you look at a practice like Ifa, you have these women that are doing the same thing and they're mm. only addressing the feminine deities. And I actually had a Babalawa who reached out to me and he said, I want to be clear. He said, they are not necessarily a part of the official practice. They've created a coven. Mm -hmm. This is how he put it. He right. said, they basically created- <laughs> You mean like witches? You yes. mean like witches? Yeah, it's yes. spiritual. It's spiritual, yes. Dennis. It's spiritual. It's yes. spiritual. He said they have created their own coven and he, and he, he used the term that's escaping me for the moment.
but he was he was saying that they basically taken this practice this feminism and they've, they've merged it with aspects of African spirituality mm -hmm. and created a whole new framework, which is not very much different from what black women have done with Christianity, to be mm -hmm. clear. It's right. really, the, it's the same concoction, it's just right. they're using a different religious base. But, right, that's right. The, but I'm pointing to the paradigm. So I'm applauding you for, uh, for tackling the issue because it is actually prevalent, but we just don't, we haven't had, we haven't put a vocabulary to it so we see it, we just don't know what to do with it. You know what I mean? So, so when you start to see a lot of this, what 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 one rapper friend of mine used to call this, uh, this you see these women with these Erica Badu starter kits. You know, uh -huh. what you got to really pay attention to is they have actually advanced this paradigmatically as a, as as a new form of worship. But mm -hmm. it is deeper than just ego. They have right. actually invested right. in these ideas on a spiritual level. Well, Dennis, yeah. you've talked about it several times in your show you, when you've done things about the spirit of Jezebel. And it mm -hmm. also goes back to what, they, you know, to, to in theology where it talks about the spirit of the Antichrist, where women are actually trying to usurp the authority of man. It's not it's, it's not new, as Dr. Johnson pontificated earlier. It's, it's, it's the godless worship where the man so, so supposed to be. We got, we got witches now? We're dealing oh, with yes, witches? Sir. Yes, sir, we do. We do. Do the research on it. Do the oh, research no, on it. And, and, and the thing right. about it, they are actually open about witchcraft. Now, they're not hiding anymore. They're open. So he's right. It's a spiritual level. But it goes back to the annals of history. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. And it goes back to what you talked about, Ben, is about the spirit of Jezebel a couple of times. Um, and so Dr. Johnson is, is, is definitely correct. It's at a spiritual level. And some are actually using alchemy. You know, Al Erica Badu talked about her vagina and the potion that she's used. Some of it is, is actually alchemy. Where they're trying to seduce men and also subjugate them to the whims of the woman but they're marketing it as black spiritual practice right right so so if you're not you know if you're coming from a non-christian standpoint it's marketed to you as african spirituality but if you're a woman and a feminist or you have feminist leanings it's that much easier for you to accept right mm -hmm. but even in a christian context it's marketed as a black christian practice yes sir. but it actually right. is only a, it's only a few decades old especially when you look at the extent that it's gotten to and dr neil can speak to this better than anybody but these kinds of practices are subtle they're a product of feminism and we've kind of all seen it but i think many of us have underestimated its impact yeah and i would say you know the white feminists did that in this in the 70s um you know people might like mary daly they went back and they they start talking about gay uh, and they start going back into irish cultic lore and, and you know mm. pulling up and all that sort of stuff and so what happens is that so they're just kind of in, in many respects imitating what the radical white feminists did back in the 70s and early 80s um but 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 here's the thing man Th those goddesses the goddess cult the deity what have you um they have no cachet if you have no one believing in that stuff you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. you know the, 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 the validity of the goddess only goes so far as the, the believers that she has in them and so what black men have to do is that black men have to dethrone the goddess uh -oh. black men black men have to see the, the 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 goddess for what she is the goddess is an idol okay mm -hmm. and, and idols idols won't last forever um idols are subject to being smashed and dismantled uh idols are subject to uh to, to the to the to whims of history all right and so um you know from from my perspective as long as we don't worship these idols and worship these women um you know we we are not subject to um, all of their machinations in terms of what happens in the court system, what happens in the household, what happens in criminal court, what happens, you know, in, in our interactions with them. I stood out in front of a church two weeks ago and I declared that the worship service is over. All right. A black church that we are no longer worshiping this goddess. We are no longer worshiping this queen because the time because times have changed technology has transformed the landscape and as dr johnson has just uh, indicated that the, the social conditions are rapidly changing okay the latina the latina woman she is next in line white america is going to use up this black women woman rather uh until they're they're done with her and replace her i can go mm. in i go into our offices right now 
owned by ran by white men and they are stacked stacked with latinas i walk into a white office they have one black woman working in there working as an office manager these people are playing a game on these black women so this goddess cult that we're talking about it does not have a long future man doc okay you you, you just I've been trying to end this for like 20 minutes, but I gotta, I gotta get some more out of that because you just said a whole lot, especially in that last, you said they're actually replacing black women with Latina women. And I see it happening all the time. Hell, I see black men in some regards replacing black women with Latina women, uh, you know, i.e. through their dating and, and, and mating preferences. So um, what's gonna happen to black women when they realize this What's going to happen to black? What is their response going to be? Because, you know, I was going to ask you the question about, you know, if we dethrone the goddess, then they're going to play the victim role. And then, you know, and once they play the victim role, black society is going to huddle around and protect them from reaping the, 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 the what they've sown. But what are they going to, what's their response going to be when they see themselves being replaced by Latino? I mean, because that's what's happening. You, you pointed out. What are your thoughts? And then anybody else what, wants to what, what they're, what they're doing now, they're talking about sex work and prostitution and all that kind of stuff, the strip club. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, I mean, I mean, they're, they're heavily, they're, they're peddling that stuff, all right, because unconsciously or at some level, they understand some type of shift is, is, is going to take place, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but even apart from that, they are unprepared for it, unprepared for it, okay? Because in many respects, I mean, you know, black women are not, I'm just going to say this, man. A lot of these women who are caught up in the goddess cup, they're not, they're not thinking 50, 60, 100 years down the road. They're not thinking the way in which the conservatives, even here, the liberals are thinking, all right? So the Latinos, we know 50 years from now, they're going to be the majority population, all right? Yeah. Joe Biden is already, Joe Biden, the way he's handling immigration in this country right now is indicative of where the country is going. That Latina female, she is going to be the next face of diversity. The black female right now, she's the dominant face of diversity and inclusion. She is going to be replaced and she does not have a long-term plan to offset what's going to happen to her. So to the, to the degree that she's going to be dis displaced, her entire cult, her entire uh, worldview uh, is going to be upset. It's going to be interrupted. She's going to find herself in a precari precarious position in this society. And she's going to, she's just going to revel. She, yes, she's going to play the victim. She's going to, she's going to react at, as she at, has always done, but there's not going to be anyone to respond to that. You don't think she's going to run back to the black man and we're going to welcome her with open arms? I think some will, but I, I think mm -hmm. that for, 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 for too many, they're going to be in dire straits because wow. you're not going to have anyone. You, 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 well, you can't make any. <laughs> You can't make appeals to white society because white society no longer use you. Your 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 just your 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 utility has has ran out, okay. And you're not going to go to the Latinos because the Latinos have never had any use for you, okay. And so and so so you're going to have to to fend for yourself. You're going to have to be a, a a sex worker, work in the strip club, do whatever you can, strip scrape, uh, commit crime, uh, in order to survive. But you know, it's already happening. And that's mm. why I go back to the environment, because and this and, and shout out to BGS on that, because he's been one that's been pushing that for the longest. Mm. It's already happening. When you look at the economy, especially in the during the pandemic in this last year, it has humbled a lot of the, the women who have been a part of what we're talking about. I mean, it, it's it's one of the main reasons we've seen Kevin Samuels. I don't think his channel would have boomed without the pandemic. The mm. pandemic hit people so hard on a material level that you had women across race, Western women who've invested in this feminist idea so deeply that they don't even see a use for a man. And black women have led, they've been the tip of the spear on that idea. They've actually come to, to significantly begin to question those ideas because now their kids are suffering. I mean, we're about to walk into a whole period in the next 30 days where these this these rent uh, uh what do you uh what do you call it uh, the, uh, the rent the the rent uh it's, moratoriums it's over. the yeah. moratorium is over yeah the moratoriums are over people are are headed to the streets 
there's a lot of fear. Now, I'm not saying that that provides the most uh, altruistic justification for women yeah. to start knocking on brothers' doors or texting or giving you the hey, big head phone calls. But it does, that humbling does say something about the necessity of men in the lives of women, something they haven't had to grapple with significantly since the 19s, early 70s. So now it's, it's you, you have people that are starting to re-examine uh, these ideas about what they've been told since birth, that they can have it all. And they're actually starting to say, you know what, I'm realizing I can't. I'm seeing women coming out publicly to say, you know what, I was lied to. I'm 40 something years old. I don't have any kids. My career fell through and now I'm standing here really broke. I got, I got a dying, you know, dying parents that I'm, I'm having to take care of. You got grown women moving back in with their parents who are mm -hmm. out of work, watching their parents die. And many mm -hmm. of these women are unemployed. I mean, this is a reality for a lot of them. And I think those are the kind of material conditions that are forcing women to reevaluate how, how they've internalized feminism. Wow, thank you guys. You doctors have been awesome. Uh, before we leave, I want you to make sure we'll start with, tell them how they can, how they can find you, uh, uh, G with the PhD, and then Dr. Ron O'Neill, the kosher clinician, and then Dr. Tia San Johnson. How can they find you? Do you have anything coming up? Do you have any books? Uh, how can they get in contact with you? I, I don't know, go ahead, you can go first, and then uh, I'll wrap it up at the end. G with the PhD, thank you so much. How can they get in contact? Oh yeah, just uh, hit me up on YouTube, Green Gorilla. All right, you know, Green. I do a show pretty much every day. I've uh, been, you know, kind of uh, distracted lately, but uh, I'm back on deck, back on task. So hit me up. All right, hit the number one button for the Green Gorilla. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Dr. Ronald, o Ronald O'Neill, how can they get in contact with you, or where can they find you on YouTube? Yeah, uh, and, and let me just um, let, me, let me get this in them before I, I leave. Um, yes, sir. I want you all to watch Stacey Abrams. And I mm. want you to watch, I want you all to watch what the GOP, the GOP is doing right now to black female politicians in Georgia. And I want you to pay attention to what that means for the future of what we're talking about. You can catch me here on YouTube, brothers. Um, just look under Ronald. Ronald Neal, that's it. I'm right here. Catch me on Facebook on the Ronald Neal, Instagram, Ronald Neal, everything Ronald Neal. Thank you, brothers. All right, thank you. Hit the number one button for Dr. Ronald O'Neill. We appreciate his time here. Thank you so much. And also make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you appreciate what's going on. Join the channel. In addition to that, Thank you for uh, all the contributions. Uh, Dr. C uh, I'm sorry, Kosher Clinician, tell us how we can find you on YouTube or you, uh, Instagram, wherever you are. Well, well, Dennis, I want to thank you for this momentous occasion, man. You've been great. You've been honorable, and I'm forever grateful. Hopefully, we'll meet at the, at the airport when I go to Houston to travel abroad. <laughs> but, but, uh, but you're on your trip down to this place. Well, you know, well we, we're going we're gonna to take an anthropological approach to it. that what it's called. <laughs> we used to call it <laughs> But anyway, they can reach me at Seven Smalls on my Facebook account. They can reach me also under Moses Stevens. And then, and then they can reach me um, at my YouTube channel, The Kosher Clinician. You can reach me at the kosher clinician. Now, I'm trying to do this thing from a systemic approach from the psych psychological realm. And uh, and so they can reach me there. The kosher clinician, the main one, but seven smalls on YouTube, I mean, on Facebook, and also Moses Stevens. And once again, man, I'm, I'm honored. I, I really appreciate you allowing me to come in your presence, man. And thank you. Um, a million yes. thanks. I appreciate it. Wow. Are you kidding me, man? All this brain power here. Everybody give it, give it number one, number one for the kosher clinician. Thank you so much, kosher clinician. Thank you, brother. One button for the kosher, kosher clinician. And also hit the thumbs up button. All right, last but not least, definitely not least, the, the, the anchor, the one that's hitting the home runs, Dr. Tia San Johnson, man. How do they find you on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook? Maybe they can show up at your office down there. <laughs> How do they get in contact with you, Doc? 
Well, the easiest way, uh, the central hub of everything I'm doing is my website. So you can go mm. to thasanjohnson.com. You can reach me through there. You can see everything I'm doing. Um, you can get to my blog, all of that through there. You can also go to the Onyx Report with Dr. Tia San Johnson right here on YouTube. Become a member, join, subscribe, support the channel. Uh, you can also support the Institute for Black Male Studies. Go to instituteforblackmalestudies.com. That is an institute I started, uh, and I actually teach classes on it on black male studies, but I also have a lot of brothers on there that I've interviewed. I'm still trying to get that brother, you know, that attorney, you know, he's, he's, he's a little wily, but I'm oh, still man. trying to get that brother <laughs> on there. Well, we got free, we, there's free interviews, there's lectures you can check out, there's merchandise you can pick up, instituteforblackmalestudies.com. Uh, anytime you want me, I'll be more than happy. It'd be an honor to be there with you. Doc, this has been tremendous. I am, you know, I, th this was something that I, I wanted to get the right subject. You know, I wanted to get the right subject. And I think this was complex. I didn't want to just talk about it. And I, I really appreciate you all, especially you, Dr. Johnson, for coming. I know there's a different time zone over there. But look, let's make sure we give a number one for Dr. T. S. Johnson. Hit the number one button for Dr. T. S. Johnson. And uh, in addition to that, hit the thumbs up button. We got 400 people in the chat room. We got 391. But thank you all so much. Here's the thing. Um, I talked about this in the form of this is the victim goddess complex. And it's starring the black woman. My question is, how did they do it? Because, you know, I have a linear brain. And my question is, how do they do it? Because I want to be able to undo it. I've learned a lot. What they've done is they've meshed history. They've meshed facts. They even have gone so far as to incorporate some forms of spirituality to convince themselves and then convince others that not only are they the goddess, but also they're their victim. They use history to convince they're, convince they're the victim uh, to everybody else who's looking. And what does that do? It makes you feel sorry for them. I've already but, talked, explained to you. Go ahead, Doc. I just want to add before I go, brother, yes, none sir. of that could be accomplished without the white establishment. So yes, whether sir. you're talking about the university system uh, as in terms of them publishing as, as scholars or whether you're talking mm -hmm. about them having access as students, whether you're talking about media, whether you're talking about uh, the private industry, because when you talked mm -hmm. about Goldman Sachs, you know, uh, Google, Visa, these groups that are donating money are private. And each of these institutions that we're referring to are white controlled institutions that are financing this dynamic. So they mm -hmm. could not accomplish it without it. And, and if those, and, that, and I include the federal government, if all of those institutions withdrew its support, the gynocracy would fall apart within a decade. It really is so propped up on resources that we don't control that it relies on it wholly. So I just want to kind of add that component to it. They didn't do this on their own and they can't maintain it on their own. So as, as long as they're being maintained by the dominant society, but they're going to have that. But see, fellas, here's the thing. We fought the dominant society before. And mm -hmm. typically, when we do stand up, we win. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm asking you guys to do is put your simp card, put your little simpish heart, put a little concrete barrier around your little simpish heart and begin to speak up and stand up for yourself and for your nephews and for your sons and for the black boys that are to come in the future. Because if we don't take this fight on right now, we're in a situation where the black community is headed down the drain. We're not going to have the black community that invented jazz and built all of these HBCUs that came up out of slavery and built over a thousand towns that had our own economy. We're not going to have that. We will always have Africans on this planet, but we will not have what we call foundational Black America. We won't have that culture. We won't have American descendants of slaves. So this is important. This is our fight. This is the fight for our generation. And what we have to do, and all I'm asking you men to do is stand up and put yourselves first. Put yourselves first, and that's the first key. Speak speak the truth, use facts. You can use information you got from me, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Neal, the Green Gorilla, uh, the, 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 the Kosher Commission. Use all this information. Don't just use YouTube as a place where you can, you know, uh, hear about how to, you know, pick up on a girl or what trip you should take to go, go see some fine women in some other countries. Use it to fight this battle because see, everybody is not going to be able to SYSB. Everybody's not going to be able to take that trip, get a passport. And what we have to do is we have to set a precedent how we fight. And the first thing is stand up, square your shoulders back, look whoever's in front of you eye to eye, speak the truth, and begin to speak up for yourself. You've heard these eloquent PhDs, you've heard these eloquent doctors, these educated men, these 
and these these brilliant black men who understand your perspective because they are black men. And for the most part, they are the generation you're in, so they understand what you've gone through. They understand the society that we live in right now. So they're not speaking from something in the past and not, not speaking from something in the future. They're talking about their right now. So that being the case, they understand exactly what you're going through. Take that information, use this information. Don't let these women trick you into treating them like goddesses and don't fall for it when they pretend to be victims because they're neither. Either way, this is Uncle D, man. I love you guys. God bless you. Shout out to all the doctors, the three PhDs and the coaching commission. I had a great time here. Thanks, Doc. Anything else you want to say, man? Nah, just thank you, brother. Appreciate your help. Appreciate all right. you inviting me. Yes, sir, Doc. It's Uncle D, and I'm out.